Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Lots to discuss in today's rundown of all the launches that took place last week, will take place this week, and the spaceflight anniversary is due for the next seven days, so I'll keep this intro super brief. Buckle in and make sure you've hit subscribe down below and rung the bell so that you get notified of these videos when they're live so that the coverage is correct and not horribly out of date. And so let's roll the transition to our first segment, all the launches and spaceflight events that took place last week. The first launch last week was on Monday the 1st, took place in China and was the second ever flight of the Hyperbola 1 rocket. On board was a Chinese Arc 2 technology demonstration satellite, but unfortunately it never made it to space as the rocket suffered from a launch failure at around max Q, at which point smoke was seen coming from the forward part of the rocket, which promptly disintegrated seconds later, raining debris on the area around the Huiquan launch site below. An unfortunate setback for iSpace, the firm responsible for the Hyperbola 1 rocket, but hopefully they can identify the cause of the failure and take steps to ensure it doesn't happen again. The next launch of the week was thankfully a successful one. This was on Tuesday the 2nd and was the ever-reliable Soyuz 2.1, which launched from the Plesetska Cosmodrome with a Russian LOTOS S1 Signals intelligence satellite on board, which was successfully placed into low Earth orbit. Soyuz is a very reliable rocket, so it's no real surprise that the launch was a success, but it's always great to see nonetheless. The Soyuz is probably so reliable due to its creators having such a firm grasp on rocket science and engineering, which can be difficult things to master. Unless, of course, you were to use Brilliant, who incidentally have also sponsored today's episode. Brilliant is a fantastic problem-solving online resource that has over 60 interactive learning courses in science, maths, and computer science. What I love about Brilliant is they have a real skill in taking complex and intimidating topics and breaking them down into easily understood chunks. I'm guessing that if you're watching this video, then you probably find rocket launches interesting. Maybe you'd like to learn more about the physics behind these amazing vehicles, in which case Brilliant has an excellent course in classical mechanics, which provides a great hands-on learning experience on a wide range of concepts that rocket scientists work with every day, including angular kinematics, the rocket equation, and Einstein's theory of relativity, and every step of the way the content is presented in a fun and engaging way. If all this sounds good to you, then click on my link, brilliant.org slash mattlown, as using my link will not only let Brilliant know that you came from here, but also gets the first 200 people to use it 20% off their annual premium subscription. Brilliant elevates maths and science from something to be feared to a delightful experience of guided discovery, so don't forget to click the link below. Anyway, after the success of Sawyer's on Tuesday, on Wednesday the 4th of February, we were treated to SpaceX's latest Starlink launch. This was the company's 18th Starlink mission and was once again launched aboard a trusty Falcon 9. This particular Falcon 9 ended up breaking a record on this flight. It was a mere 27 days since its last flight, meaning that this is the fastest ever turnaround for a booster, with the previous record being 38 days. Crazy, less than a month between launches. Hopefully we'll see this booster ride again as it successfully touched down on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, 633 kilometers downrange from the launch site. Both fairing halves were recovered by recovery ships Ms. Tree and Ms. Chief, though one of the halves did appear a little bit damaged when a arriving into port and it's not clear if the damage is severe enough to prevent a reflight. The Starlink satellites were successfully deployed into low Earth orbit and will join the ever-growing Starlink mega constellation that will one day provide high-speed broadband on a global scale. On the same day as Starlink, we had a successful Chinese launch. This was an always reliable Long March 3BE, which launched from the Zichang Launch Complex carrying a Chinese TJSW-6 signal intelligence satellite, which was successfully placed in geosynchronous Earth orbit. The 5th of February had another rocket launch from China, but this wasn't an orbital flight. This was the maiden launch of the suborbital rocket OSX-6B, which reached an apogee of 300 kilometers. The OSX-6B is a sounding rocket built by private firm OneSpace, designed 
to reach high altitude or space itself, but not orbit. They're designed for research and development of the company's launch systems. Now, that's it for space launches for the week, but I'm sure you're all very aware that there's one last rocket launch to talk about. And that was the flight of SpaceX's Starship SN9, which took to the skies on February the 2nd. We'd been eagerly awaiting this moment for quite some time. The prototype was delayed quite a few times after SpaceX failed to receive permission to fly from the FAA, but in the end, all of these setbacks made finally seeing the stainless steel rocket fly all the more satisfactory. The goal was to perform a similar flight to the SN8, albeit to a marginally lower altitude, and then try and nail the landing this time. Unfortunately, that second part didn't really go so well. The vehicle righted itself successfully, but one of the Raptor engines failed to ignite, resulting in a hard landing that destroyed the SN9 in extremely dramatic fashion. Ironically, it didn't seem to get quite as close to a landing as the SN8, but what we have to remember is that SpaceX aren't really expecting the vehicle to perform perfectly at the moment. These are all just data gathering test flights where successful landing is a nice bonus, but not a requirement or really even an expectation. As for not looking quite as close as the SN8, there really isn't a great deal of difference between the SN9 and SN8, or even between the SN9 and SN10 and SN11 for that matter. Elon Musk has said that the next major upgrades will be Seen on the under construction SN15, which as you can see from Brendan Lewis's latest progress diagram, is coming along very nicely. The SN10 will hopefully be flying soon, it's already at the pad to undergo testing with engine mounting underway, but again, while I'm hoping it'll be the one that finally sticks the landing, there's no escaping the fact that it's largely identical to the SN8 and 9, so if it fails in the same way as its predecessors, then it's really not necessarily a concerning sign. The other Starship prototype out on the pad is the SN7.2, which is a prototype tank built of thinner stainless steel, 3mm as opposed to 4mm, which if validated would result in a huge mass saving across a full-size Starship and Super Heavy vehicle. On the 4th of February, SpaceX attempted a pressurization to failure test. However, just as the tank was fully loaded and being pressurized to limit, a small burst developed on the side of the tank, spilling out the cryogenic contents. It's unclear if SpaceX planned to patch the rupture in a similar way to the previous SN7 test tank. All remains to be seen, but what I do know is that the SN7.2 rupture was the last thing I wanted to talk about for our coverage of last week's events, which means we can segue over to our next section. All the launches we expect to see take place over the next seven days. Friday the 12th of February we'll see the next Starlink launch. This is fun, two Starlink launches to cover in a single episode of Space This Week. Without wanting to repeat myself again, let's keep this short. It'll be fairly standard game, Falcon 9 launches, Falcon 9 Stage 1 lands on boat, Starlink deploys, fairings recovered. Now that's efficient journalism right there. The next launch will be on Saturday the 13th of February and will be a suborbital flight of Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2. This is the new attempt of crewed spaceflight of the VSS Unity, after the first attempt back in December last year was aborted after the vehicle's engine cut out early. Hopefully that won't happen this time around, the engine should fire for about a minute, propelling the aircraft above the Kármán line, aka the edge of space. It doesn't have nearly enough power to get to orbit, but that's not the purpose of this vehicle. VSS Unity will be for space tourism and scientific research, capable of fulfilling a similar role to sounding Rocket and Blue Origin's New Shepard, both being examples of other suborbital vehicles. I do love Spaceship 2. It's so sci-fi. And that's coming from someone who regularly talks about Starship. I wish Virgin Galactic all the best at their first spaceflight attempt with VSS Unity. VSS Unity is actually the final expected launch of the week, which wraps up this segment of the video. If you're enjoying this video so far, then please do leave a like down below to help support us. It really helps us out against the algorithm and hey, doesn't cost a penny. And once you've done that, you can sit back and relax to our final segment. All the spaceflight anniversaries lined up to take place over the next seven days. Our first historic anniversary takes place today, February the 8th, when, in 1974, the crew of Skylab 4 returned to Earth after spending 84 days in space. This would be the final crew to visit the space station, and during their departure, they took this final photograph of Skylab. 
The mission begun with the launch of the three astronauts aboard an Apollo command module atop a Saturn 1B rocket from the Kennedy Space Center. A litany of experiments were conducted aboard the station in areas including medicine, solar observation, and Earth resources. A fourth crewed mission was planned for Skylab, but unfortunately the station's orbit decayed too much, and since it was unable to be reboosted by the space shuttle, which wasn't ready until 1981, it entered and disintegrated in the atmosphere in July 1979, scattering debris across the Indian Ocean and Western Australia. The next anniversary is the return of Apollo 14, which splashed down in the Pacific Ocean on February the 9th, 1971. I haven't got too much more to add to this one really, since we've covered this mission's milestones over the past few episodes of Space This Week, from its launch to Lunar Touchdown and now the splashdown back to Earth, which ties a nice little bow on our coverage for this mission. Next up, on February the 10th in 2009, two communication satellites, the Russian Cosmos 2251 and the American Iridium 33 accidentally collided at a speed of 11,700 meters per second, or 26,000 miles an hour. This was the first time a hypervelocity collision between two satellites occurred. Usually, hypervelocity collisions involve a satellite and a piece of space debris. The collision obliterated the two satellites. NASA initially estimated there to be at least a thousand pieces of debris larger than 10 centimeters in size generated by the collision, in addition to many smaller ones, but this number increased to over 2,000 by summer 2011. Luckily, it was determined that the risk of the debris impacting the International Space Station was low. However, a piece of debris did pass the station in March 2012 at a distance of just 120 meters. The crew took temporary refuge inside the two docked Soyuz spacecraft in case evacuation was required, though luckily the debris passed safely. It is expected that eventually all the debris will experience orbital decay and will re-enter the atmosphere. On February the 11th in 1999, Pluto crossed Neptune orbit, ending a nearly 20-year period in which it was closer to the Sun than Neptune, something not expected to happen again until 2231. We covered the anniversary of the beginning of this period in last week's History Rundown, so it's a nice coincidence that we could talk about the end of this period this week. On February the 12th, 1961, the Soviet Union launched Venera 1 towards Venus. Known as Sputnik 8 in the West, the Venera 1 would become the first ever spacecraft to fly past Venus, which took place on the 19th of May. Unfortunately, radio contact with the probe was lost before its Venusian encounter, and as such, no data was returned. Nonetheless, it was still a huge milestone for space exploration. The American Mariner 2 would attempt a similar mission profile one year later, and became the first fully successful Venus mission, scanning the planet with a pair of radio meters to reveal that Venus has cool clouds and an extremely hot surface. The Soviets would get their first completely successful Venus mission with the Venera 4, launched on the 12th of June in 1967. Also on the 12th of February in 2001, the near Shoemaker spacecraft touched down in the saddle region of asteroid 433 Eros, becoming the first spacecraft to land on an asteroid. Its name is an acronym that stands for Near Earth Asteroid Rendezvous, with the Shoemaker part added post launch in honor of planetary scientist Eugene Shoemaker. The spacecraft broadcast data from the surface until February the 28th, when the last data signals were received before the probe was shut down. A final attempt to communicate was made in December 2002, but this was unsuccessful. The probe likely succumbed to the extreme conditions of the surface of Eros. Our final anniversary is on the 14th of February, when, in 1990, the Voyager 1 spacecraft took a photo of planet Earth that later became famously known as the Pale Blue Dot image. And here it is! This was taken from about 6 billion kilometers from our planet, and Earth appears as a tiny dot within deep space, that bluish speck right there. The phrase pale blue dot was coined by Carl Sagan in his reflections on the photograph's significance, documented in his 1994 book of the same name. But the taking of the pale blue dot photograph is the last of the best historic anniversaries lined up this week, which brings an end to this segment. 
And that's it for another episode of Space This Week. It's been a crazy few seven days this past week, and who knows, with SN10 pretty much flight ready, we may not have to wait very long at all to see another starship fly. And while we wait, we've got a lot of cool anniversaries to celebrate as the days roll by. Once again, I must extend a big thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. They offer an amazing service, and I'm honoured to have them associate with Space This Week. Remember to click the link in the description or follow the on-screen URL to join, and the first 200 of you to do so will get 20% off. Once you've done that, why not watch some more videos from this channel? There's now a link to the full Space This Week playlist on the left-hand side of the screen, and on the right is a video chosen for you by YouTube itself. Hopefully it's a good pick. There's links to subscribe, check out Patreon, social media, Discord, etc. as well. You can find those in the description. But anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on Saturday for another Kerbal mission. Goodbye! Bye.